I have been an investor for the last 30 years, a professional investor not having to do with clean energy, not having to do with technology, uh, basically having to do with big sums of money for schools and foundations. And when Prop 23 was proposed, I, you know, I am a Democrat, but I was assuming that I would do absolutely nothing. And when, no, when everyone else took the exact same tack which I took, which was to do absolutely nothing, eventually I got so upset and angry that I decided that I would uh, spend my time and put up some money to try and change the dynamic about how this proposition was going to work. So I don't think I was doing anything smart. I don't think I was doing anything calculated. I think I was just lost my temper and said, you know, I'm goddamned if this is going to happen in our face. Um, and let me say, so let me talk for a second about Prop 23 and how it worked. First of all, it was the biggest vote getter of anything in 2010. There were more people who voted against Prop 23 than voted for any candidate or any proposition in the United States. So it was not something that was just slid in under the radar. Second of all, uh, in terms of, let's talk for a second, this is an environmental proposition, supposedly, and everyone has an idea of what environmentalists look like and who votes for environmental propositions. And everybody's image of that is wrong. If you look around the state of California and ask who cares the most about the environment, the ethnic group, which it's a little distasteful to talk about this, but this is how politicians think about things. The ethnic group that polls the highest for caring about the environment is Latinos. Number two, Asian Americans. Number three, African Americans. So when you have an image of who cares about the environment, please don't assume that it, is, that it is the environmentalist from the 1960s. It is a different story right now, and when, you, we, when we look at the outcome of the voting, we crushed it in those groups. And that was not a given, given the, the, the topic. But we won it in all those groups. We won it both genders, although women are more supportive. We barely lost Republicans. We killed it with Democrats. And we won it in the overwhelming number of counties. To give you an example, Orange County, which is the, I would say, the poster child for conser old-fashioned conservative California, 50.5% were yes. So they got half a percent margin in Orange County. You know, that doesn't say anything about how we did in Alameda, Los Angeles, San Francisco, where it was like 23 to 77. So that's, when you think about this, we did really well with everybody. Let me give you a few stats about what happened. Um, it was a 23% spread. Our, we raised 25 million bucks. Now let's talk for one second about the difference between what we were trying to do and what they were trying to do. And this is relevant for how we're gonna go forward in the country. Basically, we were raising money for people who were doing, not doing it because they were gonna make money out of it, doing it because they deeply felt an obligation or like me, just had a short temper and behaved badly. And we were up against people who were giving money the way you give money in investing. Like, I think it's kind of a three to one payoff and you know, so I'm gonna put in five million bucks and I think I can make 15 million bucks. And so they're responding the way an investor responds. If the odds get longer, you, don't, you decide not to invest. Whereas from our point of view, if we had started to lose, if the polls had started to go against us, we would have redoubled our efforts and tw doubled the money because we weren't doing it to make money. We were doing it because we had a conviction that it was the right thing to do. So when we think about this as a contest, intellectual, political, monetary, we're, you're coming from really different places. So in the heat of battle, you've got people who are fighting for what they believe in against people who are basically investing corporate money for a return for their shareholders. And that has to be what they're doing. I mean, I said to people throughout the campaign, if these people came into California and put their money into either side of whether there should be same-sex marriage, their shareholders would you know, try and get them into jail, which is because it's just not right to take your shareholders. The only thing they can be using their shareholders' money for in good conscience is making money for their shareholders. So it's got to be a, a risk-reward investment. Very different from what we were doing. You know, we are up against, in my opinion, as much inertia as opponents. 
if it's really just a question of a big fight with people who have economic interests against us, you know, we're all up for that. That's awesome. You know, we can just get in a big fist fight and we will win that just the way we won Prop 23. That isn't actually going to be the hard part for us. The hard part for us is that there is an enormous economic institution, the whole energy complex, that makes a ton of money, and the thing that's going to happen tomorrow unless there's a big change is exactly what happened today, only a little more so. So when we think about this conversation, salience is really important. People have to understand, oh my gosh, this is totally relevant for me. I am, this is an important thing. This is going to change my vote. This is going to change my life. And until that happens, I do not believe that we will be able to get the kind of, this is not a minor change. Energy runs through every part of our day and every part of our economy. To change this is going to take a massive change of attitude. And it's one of the reasons I felt so strongly that we'd never get a, a major energy bill in 2010 is I can't believe it's going to happen without a huge conversation at the national level. And if you think about the health care bill, if you think about civil rights, if you think about when we've changed massively, there has been a huge conversation with everybody participating, with people airing all their views, with a close examination of what's going on. And I just couldn't believe that, that was, it was going to happen in 2010, particularly in a tough environment economically, without that kind of conversation. And there hasn't been that kind of conversation. So let's talk a little bit about how we're actually, how this is actually going to play out, in my opinion, and what we can do from an organizational standpoint, not to replicate the coalition that we had against 23, but to talk about how we change the conversation, how we shake this up so it isn't just more obfuscation, climate denial, you know, kind of low level of salience for the American people. So, my sense on this is very simple. To succeed nationally, we have to succeed in California in proving that this works from a business standpoint. And we're going to be under the microscope. You know, if you read the New York Times today, uh, front page of the business section, left hand side, about how hard it is to get permitted for some solar stuff in California. We're going to be under the microscope. We're going to be under the microscope both in terms of how it works and how the economy does. So first of all, we've got to be on that really hard. At the same time, we've got to be building our national coalition. But let's talk, so I'm going to take those in order about what I think is going on in California and what's going to be necessary for us to win. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I think we can build a national coalition. I, I think California is fairly straightforward. It's retrofit, build the renewables market, create a good climate for clean tech businesses and manufacturers. So those are the three things we need to do. They have different time frames. I actually spoke yesterday to try and talk to the Democratic state senators up in Sacramento talking about what they needed to do. I don't know if I was insightful and I don't know if I changed any minds, but I did go up there and say, you know, this, I'm a business person. We do investments. I've done investments for 30 years. These are the things that investors worry about. The easiest part of this is retrofitting. You know, if you've looked at the numbers, there's 3 billion square feet of commercial office space. The paybacks are really good. We need to make sure they can be financed. But we can get a huge jump on all this stuff. Getting business people to make smart decisions about retrofitting commercial office space, it can save an enormous amount of energy. It looks like about 40% on average. Uh, the payoffs are good. It's a great start. We can do it right now. And in fact, we've been trying to, it's, and it's also great jobs. The second thing about renewables is something where we've got to be hard-nosed, we've got to be smart, we've got to look at things from a you know, data-driven standpoint, and it's going to happen. You know, that was really about setting up a playing field where it can happen, and a lot of you guys are involved in that and know more about it than I do, so I don't want to stress on that for the moment. What I do want to talk about is setting up an environment where businesses can succeed. Because we, there's a real reason why California can succeed in this. You know, we have most of the venture money. We have a history of innovation. We have, uh, the, we have demands based on AB 32. We have a green consciousness, and we have a pool of entrepreneurs and engineers that can make this happen. So we have huge advantages. We've done it in IT. We've done it in biotech. We've done it in aerospace. California can do this very well. I have 
very, very little doubt that we will create a lot of businesses in California to address this problem. That's what we're built to do, it's gonna happen. I'm not worried about that. There's a disconnect here, however. The question is, if we create the businesses, where will we create the jobs? Because if there's one thing going on in the, state, in the United States that people don't seem to get, it's that there isn't a California economy, there's not an American economy, we're part of the global economy. And so when people in DC wonder why the breakdown has occurred between growth and job creation, and that's something that people have been debating, you know, why do we have 9.4% growth? When actually we're growing, I mean, unemployment, when the models that they have said we should never have gone over eight and a half and it should be trending down into the eight or high sevens, they're really wondering about this. And it's actually very simple. We're in a global economy. We've created tens of millions of jobs other places. And so when we think about California succeeding, don't forget, the jobs part of this, if we don't have an environment that is conducive to locating things here for the people who are not the entrepreneur, not the design person, not the chief engineer, but the, the people who are doing the actual building of manufacturing stuff, we're not gonna get the kind of job creation that we need. And that's actually gonna be important from a policy standpoint. I don't believe that the Democrats who I've spoken to for the most part, they're not gonna fight this, they're also not gonna fight for this in a passionate way. That is not what's going on in Washington, D.C. I don't know who there you know, really feels that they're willing to lie down on the tracks for this, but I just haven't seen it. So I don't feel that, that, that our goal has to be Democrats. I think our goal has to be to build the coalition. And there are really four groups that I think if we had them, we'd get the passion. If we had them, we could go anywhere in the United States and make this argument. Number one, of course, is business. We, I don't believe business people are bad. I'm a business person. I believe business people have no interest in going home and telling their kids, you know, today we really screwed up the planet. It was terrific. You guys are screwed for the rest of your lives. They don't want to do that. They want a chance to participate this, in this in a way that can work. And I think that, you know, that is a message that can only be brought by other business people and other people who are trustworthy messengers. Because one of the big things I believe is you've got to have a messenger who can be heard. You know, you really do. It's not just the message, it's who presents it and how they present it in a way that people can accept it. So business is one huge point I think we have to make. The second is Republicans. I have no, I, I don't believe this is gonna happen without Republicans believing they can be part of this coalition. They may not dominate it, but they've got to be part of it, and it's got to be a conversation we, can, we have. We cannot be fighting a united group of Republican legislators and voters. One of the things I truly believe we have to do for this to work is I believe we have to approach communities of faith. Because if you want to really hit people where they live to make this salient, we have to be able to sit down with people of faith and explain to them why, if they think about it, this is a truly important part of what they believe. I happen to be pretty religious. I have no qualms about sitting with people and talking about God. And I think unless we do that, unless we can relate to people on that level, we're cutting ourselves off from a lot of the way people really make decisions going forward, and I think a huge potential ally. It's not that, I believe that a lot of different faiths are supportive of us, but I don't believe that it's something that's our leading priority for me, and I don't believe without that it's gonna happen. And lastly, I think we can get a huge amount of support from national security. That means people in the military, former military officers, and people who've been responsible for national security. Because that is something where I actually don't believe this is the argument that will sway Americans to make this important. But I believe that if you want to win an argument, you've got to show up with people who give you credibility. And I don't know how many more People have, how many people have more credibility than some general with four stars on his shoulders or somebody who's been planning you know, the most serious military operations or who's flown a bunch of combat miss missions. Those are people who get a ton of respect and I believe they're people who understand what this means to the United States and are gonna be willing to step up with us and really care about it. And I think that if we can actually go to those four people we will always have the people who are traditional allies. We'll always have the environmental groups. 
We'll always have you know, the people who are the most liberal. In order to win this national argument, we have to be able to reach out to the people who aren't our natural allies and convince them not just that we're right, but that it's really important that they be on our side because the salience of this, the fact that people believe this is a huge part of what is gonna to happen to this country, to themselves and their families, is the way that we're gonna win this argument. Ultimately, of course, we have to get to DC, but I've had a completely different attitude about DC than most of the people who are admittedly smarter than me and have more experience. My experience going and reading history of when things happen in DC is after the country decides what it wants. You know, they didn't lead the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was won long before the Voting Act. That was something where by the time that we got the Voting Act, the fight was over to a very large extent. That's what's gonna happen here. DC is not gonna lead. DC is gonna be the validation of the conversation that goes on across the country and that hopefully we will be pushing and winning on a consistent basis over the next years and hopefully not decades. Thank you very much.